And now I'd like to uh, bring up TJ. Where are you? Oh, there you are. I'm looking right at you. TJ is a wonderful photographer and uh, advocator for, for forests, and he's with the um, Ancient uh, uh, Alliance for, you know, for Old Growth. And fabulous, uh, I've seen so many of your photos, and they're terrific. So come on up. <laughs> okay, so here's our slideshow. There's Dan Hagar, actually. He's the president of the, uh, the Port Renfrew Chamber of Commerce. And this is by the Tolkien giant in the Walbrand Valley. So how many people here have been to the Walbrand Valley before? Yeah, it's sort of like ground zero for the ancient forest campaigns uh, on southern Vancouver Island. Um, but, you know, time is running out. Our big trees are turning into big stumps now. And if you look at the mapping, um, this is the original uh, old growth um, on, at the time, sorry, at the time of European uh, colonization, you would have had the majority of the southwestern coast as productive old growth forests in green. That's moderate to fast growth rates where the trees um, grow big and are of commercial value. Low productivity old growth, you see in that kind of green, uh, brownish, greenish, that's, those are the bog forests and the high altitude areas. All right? So those areas are of low commercial value for logging. Um, and there's some, quite a bit of alpine in the white. The um, data we have from 2012 um, shows that the majority of the productive old growth forest uh, has, had, has been logged, about 75% of it. Um, and most of the low productivity old growth is still there for the simple reason you can't log it. The reason is the discrepancy between the government statistics, statistics and our statistics, they show like twice as much old growth, is because they're including the, the bog forest, the bonsai stunted stands, and also near the top of the mountains. It's a, a disingenuous um, kind of PR spin. It's like including your monopoly money with your real money and then claiming to be a millionaire. So why curtail spending your real money? <laughs> so, so what we're seeing for the second growth now is to, we need to sustainably log second growth forests. Sustainably means um, uh, at a slower allowable annual cut, a slower pace of cut. Um, so that the forest can age so that you actually get that higher uh, value um, timber that, that has a lot less of the juvenile uh, core and the wide rings that, that uh, Ray is referred to. And we need a, a plan to end logging of uh, old growth forests now. And so the contrast is even more striking on southern Vancouver Island where you have the most amazing, uh, grandest ancient forests. Uh, Outside of the California Redwoods, it's the Olympic Peninsula and southern Vancouver Island, which have had the, the grandest uh, trees in, in the, the world. And now we're down to, on the South Island, about 12% of the moderate to high productivity old growth. For productive old growth, that's high productivity, you're looking at about 4%. Those are the classic stands that you see in the valley bottoms, the big trees. So we're getting to the last stretch here. But the yellow there is second growth, and we can build the sustainable industry on that. About 13% of the land base on Vancouver Island is protected in our park system. That's only 6% of the productive forests because a lot of the park system is above the tree line, uh, like in Strathcona, um, non-forested, or low productivity old growth forests. These are old shore pines, 200, 300, 400 years old. They are old growth, but they are not. Uh, this is what the government statistics, by the way, is why there's so much old growth everywhere. Is the, um, it, what the, the real contention is about the... Um, moderate to high productivity old growth forests, which are coming to an end now. Um, so the big thing we have to educate people on um, is why you can't um, just replant the trees. Because it's a typical thing. Most people will think, well, you cut down the old growth and then you plant the trees, so why is there an issue? Um, and then the, the incorrect response is, the trees aren't growing back, man. It's going to become the Sahara Desert if you love. That's not true. <laughs> What's happening is it's being converted into a... Uh, into second growth managed tree plantations. Um, so they, they are structurally different than the ensuing old growth and they are to be relogged every uh, 30 to 50 years, increasingly on the coast. I think it's about 55 years now is the coastal um, rotation that they're operating on. So what are some of the differences? We need to educate people on the differences. And the only way you, you get around this is with time, with age. You know, it takes hundreds of years, there's no shortcut. So old growth forests, they have, a lot, uh, they have gaps in the canopy, lets the sunlight through. They have a lot more uh, well-developed understories. Second growth forests have closed canopies, less understory. 
Um, old growth forests have a lot of standing and fallen uh, woody debris, standing and fallen dead trees, which are home to a lot of creatures. Um, they also have multi-layered canopies, big trees, medium-sized trees, little trees. Second growth forests are the same, uh, trees are of the same age class in the same stand. So they're less structurally complex, less diverse. Um, and as a result, old growth forests are home to a whole lot of uh, unique species, um, either old growth obligates, they have to live in old growth, like the marbled murrelet, or old growth associated species, like the northern goshawk. The marbled murrelet uh, lives in uh, specialized habitats. It needs a, uh, a elevated structure, about 20 to 30 centimeters wide, a mossy uh, limb, uh, in order to raise its nest. It's a, it's an environment at risk, obviously, because of old growth logging. If you eliminate the old growth forest, the only place left is on Trump's hair. <laughs> the only elevated structure, 2030, <laughs> mossy. <laughs> but it's a risky environment, too. <laughs> always use that in recent times. <laughs> TJ's shot. <shop. laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, uh, other reasons old growth are important. They, they store two to three times more carbon per hectare than the ensuing second growth plantations. If you replace them by second growth, it'll take 200 plus years to re-sequester the carbon, but no one waits 200 years. So, um, and also old growth forests are vital for First Nations cultures that evolved in old growth forests over millennia. I think the latest was, this is what, what is it, 14,000 years for the Heltzik settlement they found? Which is pretty incredible, a 14,000 year old settlement. So these um, ancient cedars in particular are important, um, not just for bark stripping, but um, to build the totem poles, to build the canoes for the long houses. You need old growth. You can't have a little second growth to carve a canoe, <laughs> unless you have dolls inside the canoe. Um, all right, some, um, some places and trees. TJ will go over this. Right, thanks, Ken. Thank you all for being here. Happy to share some of my photographs with you, and I'll start with uh, the San Juan spruce tree out near Port Renfrew. Mm -hmm. British Columbia is home to the largest trees in all of Canada, and this here is one of them. This is uh, just an amazing Sitka spruce covered with mats of moss and big ferns, even probably what's maybe the largest mushroom or fungi in all of Canada growing up on the top left side, an agaricon fungi. Not far from the San Juan spruce is the Red Creek fir. This is the world's largest Douglas fir tree at over 240 feet tall. It's taller than Niagara Falls and it's 14 feet wide at its base. And then there's this tree here, the Chiwat Giant, which is Canada's largest tree. It has a, a wood volume equivalent of 450 telephone poles in a single tree. Pretty amazing that this is right here in our backyard and thankfully this tree is protected within the Pacific Rim National Park Reserve uh, near Nitnat Lake or the Carmanan Valley. Another tree that's become quite famous as of late is this one here. <laughs> Anyone know the name of this tree? Lonely yeah, Big Lonely Doug, and it's not hard to see where the tree gets its name. Unfortunately, all of uh, Doug's old growth friends were cut down around him in 2012, leaving him standing alone in this clear cut. Can you see the, the person at the base there for scale? Yeah, that kind of puts it into perspective at, at just how large these trees are. What was his loss? Sorry? Well, uh, likely as a wildlife tree, um, and there were some other large trees in the background here. It's hard to see, but there were some other huge stumps from big trees that were taken out. But today he still stands. And uh, yeah, we measured the tree. Here's Ken wrapping a tape around the base. It's over 13 feet wide. And that's a woodpecker. <laughs> and to get an accurate height measurement on this tree, we actually teamed up with a group of tree climbers um, to ascend Big Lonely Doug. You really feel like an ant on the side of a log as you're going up the trunk of this towering tree. Here's another view that, again, the human really puts the scale of these giant trees into perspective. And this is a view from when I climbed up, looking down towards the ground. It was a really interesting perspective that you couldn't see from the ground, which is uh, Big Lonely Doug's shadow actually being cast onto the clear cut, which to me seemed like almost a metaphor for uh, the hand of a clock going around and the ticking of time and the, the pace at which we're losing our old growth forests. Any questions? Was the logging company 
forced to leave that one tree? No, well, it would have been one of the original engineers, a forest engineer, who decided to leave that tree and actually left a couple others behind. Um, uh, Hans? There's a, actually a nice story in Walrus about it. And I guess the logger in charge uh, kind of fell in love with the tree and just decided to leave it. Oh, so it's okay. Okay. Thank you. Unapproved of it. Yeah. But that being said, there's stumps just beside this tree that measure 14 feet wide. In fact, even larger this one as far as the cedars go. So um, this would have been much better off, of course, with the forest around it. Um, just is adjacent it, to this, though. Is it likely to survive wind? All um, by itself there? It, you know, it's pretty wind firm. It's likely withstood being somewhat on its own before. There's uh, evidence of blowdown around it in the past. But, uh, it, you know, if you look at the Red Creek fir, which stands on its own, it's still standing, but it's lost a majority of its large branches. So um, we'll have to, only time will tell. But I hope it stays standing. So anyhow, just looking at this clear cut, it can be kind of hard to imagine what the forest around this tree would have been like at one point in time. But all you have to do is step across a creek into the adjacent forest or the Eden Grove to just see just how magical this landscape truly is. This is just about 30 minutes outside of Port Renfrew and some of the finest remaining old growth forests at the low elevation right along the Gordon River. Uh, there's, there's only about 4% of this old growth forest remaining on southern Vancouver Island. This area is also unprotected and an area that we're working to save. Here's a shot I got from a trail camera <laughs> um, of a black bear climbing the same tree that I was standing beside in the previous one. I noticed that there were claw marks leading up to this opening here, so I set up a remote camera to capture that photograph there. Well, I'm not sure. I've moved the camera a little higher now to see if I can capture a clip of it actually going into the hole, but uh, I have to go back and keep checking on it. Uh, just a little ways north, or up island from there, is the endangered Central Walbrand Valley. So this was an area that was left out of the Carmana Walbrand Provincial Park when it was created in the early 90s. And conservationists have been fighting to save it ever since. In the background, this area is within the provincial park, but really it's the old growth forest that you see along this slope, the upper castle grove, and the castle grove down here, which is the finest old growth red cedar stand left in Canada. But just only a couple of years ago, the logging company Teal Jones proposed eight new cut blocks along this hillside and along the hillside outside the screen here, one of which has been approved that caused a recent uproar and attention around the need to protect the Walbrand Valley, because it's truly one of the most magnificent forests really on planet Earth. If you go down into the Castle Grove, you'll find trees like this, the Castle Giant, a 16-foot diameter old-growth red cedar that is just it totally changes your perspective on just how big a living organism can be. Um, but it's not just trees, it's the whole area in general just has so much recreational opportunity with these beautiful waterfalls cascading down to emerald green pools of water you can swim in in summertime. And of course, it's home to much wildlife. There's some black bear cubs playing around in a little hemlock tree. And the most special thing that happened just this past year when we were leaving the Walbrand encountered cougars uh, on the road out of the valley there. So this is an amazing wilderness area that truly needs to be protected immediately. Uh, we're working to save the mossy maple grove. This is near Lake Cowichan. It's unique in that it's an old growth deciduous rainforest. So these are big leaf maple trees and they're just completely covered in these thick mats of moss and licorice ferns. Um, a truly special area. This is found on, on uh, or just near Lake Couchin. And up near Port Alberni, we're working to protect the Cameron Valley Firebreak. We were actually just there yesterday. Um, this is like a second cathedral grove. It's so rare to find a stand of densely packed old growth Douglas fir trees today. They're virtually non-existent. There's about 1% of the old growth coastal Douglas fir trees left on BC's coast. Um, and this is found on Island Timberland's private land. So we have a, a separate, a campaign separate from our um, our public land campaigns where we're working for the government to create a park acquisition fund, which essentially would see what we're calling for $40 million a year put aside to purchase areas that are endangered on private lands. Um, on the lower mainland, we've uh, got a major campaign to protect the old growth forest at Echo Lake. This is near Mission or Agassiz. Um, thankfully, after years of hard work, 
We had 60% of the old growth forests around Echo Lake protected in an old growth management area. Um, it represents some of the finest old growth in the lower mainland region. But it's not just the big trees that are important here, it's the wildlife. So just nearby, at the confluence of the Harrison and Chehalis rivers, you have thousands and thousands of bald eagles that come during the fall salmon run to feed on the salmon. And at night, hundreds of them will fly back to Echo Lake and roost in the old growth Douglas fir trees around the lake. And it's thought to be the world's largest night roosting site for bald eagles. But uh, unfortunately, right now, there's a road that's being pushed in um, with plans to log on the northern side of Echo Lake, the remaining 40% that needs protection. Um, I'm leading a hike there tomorrow, and there's going to be, I'm sure, a lot more news and, uh, and a push from our side to save this forest before it's too late because it's such a truly special place, especially for the eagles. Um, and also, who's been here? Avatar Grove before Rent Room. <laughs> This has really become a household name. It's, it's such a unique and, and amazing old growth forest. Um, it's about 15 minutes outside of Port Renfrew. And this is an area that I stumbled upon in late 2009 when I was out looking for big trees and old growth forests for, for people to go and visit and hike to. And it was really this site right here that caught my attention with those spires of the old cedar trees sticking up out of the woods. And upon walking down into the forest, came across this otherworldly place with these exceptional uh, red cedars with alien-shaped burls on the side and old-growth Douglas fir trees. And we knew right away that it had the potential to become the, key, the cathedral grove of Port Renfrew due to its accessibility. And um, we right away started working to promote the area. But it was flagged for logging. This is uh, uh, Ken beside a giant red cedar that probably one of the most photographed cedars in the grove today with it spray painted um, back in 2010. So we took thousands of people out to see this area. We led dozens and dozens of public hikes, built a huge groundswell of public momentum, uh, worked with local politicians, but also most importantly built an alliance with the local business community and started working with the Chamber of Commerce, which was a unique approach. Um, for an environmental organization. And that uh, combination of relentless public pressure and thousands of letters being written, um, politicians speaking up for this area, and the business community being on board saying that this would provide a sustainable economic future for the town as they move away from being uh, a largely uh, a logging town in the past. We were successful in having the Avatar Grove protected in uh, February of 2012. So you can see on the cover of the Times column. Yeah. So today, under the guidance of our friends in blue here, <laughs> they're real slave drivers, you know? Just, we've been uh, building a boardwalk to protect the ecological integrity of the area, to protect the tree roots from uh, all the visitors that are coming to see this area today and to improve visitor access and safety. We built new entranceways up into the forest, as this has really become the economic driver of Port Renfrew, who are branding themselves now as the tall tree capital of Canada. They're home to Avatar Grove, Big Lonely Doug, the Red Creek Fir, San Juan Spruce. They're kind of on the doorstep of the Carmana Valley, the Walbrand Valley. Um, and they've embraced this new vision of, of actually benefiting um, by the, from the land by leaving these trees standing instead of cutting them down. So it's a magical place. I encourage everyone to get out there and visit if you haven't already. And just um, be grateful that on this Earth Day that we have ecosystems like this right here in our backyard and get out and explore them. So I'll leave the rest for Ken and have some questions after. OK, so just the last stretch on what we do and what some things that you can do as well. A lot of what we do is we do expeditions to explore um, ancient forests and also the destruction in different clear cuts and we can't announce it yet but we, uh, we came across another amazing stand just about two weeks ago that, that I think will be Avatar 2 probably need a new name though for the other place but uh, it's another it's a spectacular monumental stand a lot of exploration TJ does a lot of photo and video which is foundational especially in the uh, world of um, online social media now which is like half of how people are getting the information probably more than the news media now but the news media also runs with these images, makes it real for people. We organize a lot of public hikes. So one thing we are arranging is in the Lower Mainland, um, 
the um, uh, Chinese speaking community is, is like most of the people actually in a huge area. So you would be the um, uh, oppressed ethnic minority in the world. <laughs> uh, so, so what we've started is uh, Mandarin language old growth tours to begin with, to make inroads in that 500,000. <laughs> so with First Nations, now British Columbia's First Nations are highly diverse and uh, but the most important, um, they are the most important level of government uh, when it comes to determining the fate of old growth forests. Um, there's been great news, for example, in the Great Bear Rainforest where you have about 70% of the forests now coming under protection, 85% of the old growth, as a result of the work by the First Nations with Greenpeace, Sierra Club, uh, Forest Ethics, now called STEND, um, to, to protect those areas. In, uh, in Haida Gwaii, the Haida have announced that over 51% of their, their uh, lands are now within Haida protected areas, as well as within the National Park. And uh, just very recently, you might have heard that in Clackwood Sound, the Ahousat First Nations have now declared 82% of their territories, include, including most of Flores Island and most of the old growth, uh, as um, their own uh, Ahousat um, protected areas. So there's huge strides forward in old growth protection. That is in large part driven by First Nations having economic alternatives. So uh, in other words, the, the conservation movement has been working with First Nations um, to bring in uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for First Nations communities as a means to finance tourism, as a means to finance uh, sustainable seafood harvesting, maybe renewable energy projects, non-timber forest products, but so to make sure that there's some means so that there are jobs and revenues from keeping all that forest standing instead of cutting it down. Because right, the companies have also been making revenue sharing agreements and job agreements and there's also a lot of logging rights divvied up during the Gordon Campbell era for First Nations all over the coast in the old, remaining old growth. So the way around that is when First Nations, they've shown every time that when they have an economic alternative to logging the old growth, um, then they, they move in that direction. So our biggest thing is that, and we get it, everyone needs a job, we all need jobs, everyone needs, there's got to be an economy, right? We don't exist on nothing. So the question is how to do it sustainably. So our big thing is, um, along with uh, building broader movements, we need to work with First Nations communities and with a lot of these conservation groups who've been working in those areas to develop economic alternatives for the First Nations as a uh, part of the context from which we can end logging of old growth on Vancouver Island, Lower Mainland, and the inland rainforest across the province. Oh, by the way, that was the first, uh, one of the very first old growth protests organized by the Tolokwiat and Ahousat First Nations for Mears Island. We've also been working a lot with uh, unions. So we've made the first alliances with forestry workers when I was kind of working on, on those issues with, through the Wilderness Committee back then, with the Pulp Paper and Woodworkers of Canada and the Ubo Timberless Society. We've continued to work with forestry workers and unions um, the the blue collar um, uh, forestry workers can flip between right and left um, in their politics. Uh, quite this is a populist vote. It's vital that we spend time working with these communities um, in order to bring them on board the, uh, the ancient forest movement. Now the PPWC has passed a resolution calling for an end to old growth logging on Vancouver Island, like just a few weeks ago, which is amazing for a forestry union to say no logging of old growth on Vancouver Island. Um, we work with the Port Renfrew Chamber of Commerce, so the, uh, and uh, then the Souk Chamber of Commerce, and the West Shore Chamber of Commerce, and then the BC Chamber of Commerce to get resolutions passed to end logging of old growth forests. Subsequent to that, Andy McKinnon, um, the forest ecologist who's also a councillor in Machosan, now running for the Greens in Esquimalt, Machosan, um, got a resolution passed in Machosan, and we work with him to get it passed in the AVICC and the Union of BC Municipalities. So all the local governments, uh, mayors and town councils have passed a resolution calling for an end to old growth logging on Vancouver Island. The other aspects that we're working on, it's churches and faith groups. So if anyone here is part of a, a church, uh, that is the central, one of the most important things that we can do now is build supporting the faith communities. Anyone owns a business, um, we also need to work with businesses to get um, to sign statements uh, as well in favor of saving old growth. Um, and we're working in the lower mainland with um, the Chinese speaking population. But the main uh, kind of takeaway lesson for us, I think for in building these movements is we can't keep organizing our own base of environmental activists. Activists in general become much more effective when they 
get non-activists to organize, um, uh, you know, get, get, take part in these movements. Um, and environmentalists are most effective when we get other people to become environmentalists. But to see things from their perspectives, understand what their interests are as well, that's the entry point. So that's the main thing is, um, but time is running out. These are time constrained issues. This is the Klanawa Valley, just the flyover a year ago, where you see just a few little tufts of ancient forest left among the clear cuts and the tree plantations. That's a typical site across Western Vancouver Island. Um, the last of the giants are coming down. We're one of the last jurisdictions uh, that has these um, thousand year old ancient forests. Um, and we're one of the last jurisdictions where the government says, cut them down, let's go to the end. Except for the, the small amount under protection, they will come to an end uh, in the near future. So uh, what you can do besides supporting ancient forest lines is um, round up support if you are part of a union, part of a faith uh, group, um, if you have a business, uh, get in touch with us and let's snowball this movement far beyond bigger, broader, uh, large scale, and then we will change those outcomes. Thank you. Just a quick mention, by the way, in the inland rainforest, it stretches over a huge distance. And up in the Prince George area, everyone keeps asking us if we had built a trail there, because this is an ancient forest trail just east of Prince George. That's a totally different group. It was a guy, uh, Darwin, um, a biology professor named, ecology professor named Darwin. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> and he, him and his group uh, saved that area. And now there's an ama amazing ancient forest trail. I haven't even been there yet myself. We haven't had a chance, but looking at the pictures, that's another avatar grove of the northern rainforest. Can, uh, when I talk to some of the logging companies, they say that they can't be profitable without logging old growth on Vancouver Island. What are you doing, and what can be done to make second growth profitable and sustainable? Yeah, second growth is profitable because it is the, the main thing that's being logged. If they have to log old growth in order to survive, how is it then the rest of uh, the, most of the interior BC, the rest of Al Canada, the rest of the United States, the rest of the world. <laughs> like how's it, nobody can survive unless they log thousand year old trees. Bullshit, everyone else is logging second, third, fourth growth. So uh, like yeah, what is, and in fact, when you drive up the highway now, it's mainly second growth. So that's not profitable, which is why we're cutting it. It's, no, it's just, that's bunk. It's just that they can make the most money. From, they can make um, a lot of money from, in terms of the timber volume and the high quality wood from logging those last stands of old growth, but that's not the only way you can survive. Everyone else is logging second, third. Do you have anything proactive? It's not by convincing them, you know, by our words. It's going to be the law. So in the end, the reason we push for all this is we want legislation, and that's why we have to push the government, and that's why we need to work with First Nations um, to get uh, laws in place to, to right? It's like they need to, we have to get handcuffs around the corporations because they don't self-regulate. They will go down to the last 1% of old-growth Douglas firs, like we are already now, if they can make money from logging the last of them. So. Um, sorry, quick question. Aside from the profitability, is there something that can only be done with old-growth forests that could be done with second or third? Well, you have um, high, higher quality wood, stronger, denser wood in old-growth. Um, so for a lot of value-added products, um, then old growth is the best. And in some cases, um, previously, it was the only thing. But today, the advancements in, uh, in uh, wood technologies, if you go to UBC, uh, there's, with sawdust <laughs> and, and the, like, the little wood, wood chips and fibers, you can make all manner of, of strong um, uh, wood products. So there's no reason you have to use old growth for those purposes. How are you linking in the salmon store to this? To salmon? Yeah. Um, well, we make that as one of the key points. So we talk about why we need old growth forests. It's to, for endangered species, for uh, tourism, for the climate, for clean water, and for wild salmon and First Nations cultures. But um, wild salmon, uh, you know, in a lot of ways are an old growth dependent species in the sense that if you log the old growth watersheds, then you have huge impacts. And that's been shown all over the coast. Um, on the, the young salmon, on scouring out the, the um, gra spawning gravels, on siltation of the, the young um, of, of the eggs. So that's a point we you know, include in the roster of things. We
Well, there's a diversity of organizations with different niches, right? So from a, sometimes from a distance, it might look like, I've heard people say like, why doesn't everyone just get together and form one environmental group? Um, sort of like, why don't all conservatives all get under the you know, Republic Trump banner? Uh, there, there's a whole lot of different niches. And so our particular niche is uh, comprehensive legislation to save old growth forests um, and sustainable second growth forestry through new uh, reductions in the allowable annual cut, this sort of thing. But as you see, there's a whole lot of projects. There's hundreds of them, by the way. So there's a lot of people approaching us, but we can't actually move on it. Like constantly we're getting approached by people about battles in their communities, different projects. And there's just the two of us who've been campaigning here. Now we've got three new staff, so we're gonna be able to expand. But we still can't deal with 100 other partner organizations. We just have to pick and choose a few in the old growth uh, that we're trying to save. So the, everyone here's got, sounds like, great projects as well. And then when you look across the province, there's these little kitchen table groups. Everyone's working on things. And there's a lot of, but if you want to save old growth with comprehensive legislation, um, we are the main group, I believe, that is spearheading a diverser, a more diverse um, uh, movement. I, my, my one criticism of, of uh, quite a few environmental groups is that they are basically always organizing other environmentalists, activists organizing activists, and hipsters organizing hipsters, and Fernwood organizing Fernwood. <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to change it. Um, what are is it my understanding that even though the Great Bear Rainforest has been basically protected, there's still loopholes that are allowing logging in there um, and trophy hunting and that kind of thing? So, that, in other words, we can't really relax about even those so called protected areas. There's still governments allowing. Things to happen in there that shouldn't be. Yeah, like we, we um, hope and pray and are working towards something like the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement for uh, if we can get protection levels at 70% down on Vancouver Island, where we're at 6% in the parks, and then you another 2% in old growth management areas, we would be sure happy to, to make it 10 times more. But um, in the Great Bear Rainforest, uh, there, so on forestry, it is far more advanced. You've got two types of um, protections. You've got the hard protections in the provincial conservancies. That's about 40% of the forest. Then another 30% is protected through um, ecosystem-based management forest reserves. Forest reserve is similar to our riparian zones and old growth management areas. These are the areas that um, they, they do keep the forest standing in most cases. Sometimes they can be a little versatile. So it's like, uh, I always imagine sort of like wearing a bear costume while you hang out among grizzlies and you're not totally sure <laughs> how long your protection is going to last. Uh, um, so it can feel like that sometimes. But in the net totality is the ecosystem-based management forest reserves is a huge leap forward. That's another 30%. So, so, but do we have to be vigilant? Other governments may try to take that back over time. That's true. Uh, with grizzly hunting, that's separate from the land use planning around forest protections. Um, and obviously, you know, it doesn't make sense to be, be um, from an you know, ethical perspective, be trophy hunting grizzlies. That's another fight that, that others are taking on. But th if we can get that here, 70% protection levels, we'd be more than happy. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Have you seen the Times columnist travel section today? On Avatar. Yeah. I, I just yeah. sent that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Three pages, the biggest travel section I've ever seen, and they mentioned you guys and, and the work that you've done. And the fact that when we go to these places, I think I read this in your information years and years ago, say you're going to see the trees and let mm -hmm. the people in the town know that's why you're there. Yeah, I spoke with that reporter just a few days ago. Oh, cool. and she'd been out there and, and totally had an amazing, amazing time. She said, I hope people read this article. It's pretty long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just say, it's scrolling and scrolling, but it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and you know, even on a day, we were fixing the trails out there recently after a big windstorm knocked uh, a bunch of the smaller trees down the lower Avatar Grove. There was about a foot of snow on the ground. It was pouring rain, it was about two degrees. And there were still six or seven cars that showed up. People of all ages putting their rain ponchos on. They're out there and still saying they're having the most fantastic day of their life. And, and that's just been an incredible thing to watch. Thank you.
we're producing very poor quality wood, as you've already uh, indicated in your comparison with old growth. And we have models for this. We have the Swedish model, which originally cut all of their forests, but now they have managed, a managed uh, forest system which allows them, their, their trees can develop what we would call the same quality, relatively same quality as old growth forests. And that is the future of logging in British Columbia. Uh, and it has to be part of the equation because it takes the pressure off the remaining old growth, hopefully. Yeah, and I fully agree that the, um, like maybe a little clarification on what um, Ray was talking about. I don't think Ray was saying we need to log the old growth because it has the high quality wood. But what there is, is once you let the densely packed stand, so no commercial thinning. If you don't commercially thin, you get these trees that grow very, they're still fairly skinny by about 110 years old. Um, see if I uh, ask uh, to, if I'm getting this correctly. But by about 110 years old, you get these densely packed stands with um, very little of the, the uh, very few branches. And you, you can get one plank out of them, but you still have the, the higher quality wood. If we were to let the rotation age go um, from, now it's about 55 now to about 110 is about the minimum age. But I also believe in actually letting, protecting second growth and letting it become old growth. And then you can have more old growth logging, careful, slow old growth logging um, so that you can get the high quality wood and you'll have the biodiversity there. I'm not in principle against, against um, logging old growth. It's only when it's scarce, then, then it makes sense to save you know, what remains. Like if there's too few deer in a game management unit, then you have to end deer hunting there. If there's too few trout in certain streams, you have to end trout f fishing there. If there's too little old growth in whole regions, then you have to end old growth logging there for a few centuries. <laughs> just a, yeah. I can just make, this has been a, one of the things that the police came up uh, in terms of what about the potential for better management of the second growth. And uh, what I would say uh, is, is that the huge area that we haven't even attempted to understand is what you mentioned in terms of commercial. You see, when a stand gets established, there might be two or 3,000 trees per hectare. If nothing happens in terms of human activity, when you get that, uh, a hundred years, you only have five or six hundred trees left. Okay, we've lost most of those trees, eighty percent of them. Now, what happens to them? They die. Okay, and ecologically, that's fine. Okay, but what happens in places where wood is tight, like Sweden, they get thirty percent of their conifer wood supply from thinnings, and and here we get zero. Okay, okay. Now there's a huge amount of infrastructure have to be built and all kinds of things. I really don't want a lot of people running around out there in our young forest compacting the soil and creating erosion and all that. Uh, but that, that opportunity is, is potentially there, is what I'm saying, and we do nothing okay, in terms of uh, doing, uh, uh, getting, keeping our economy going uh, better than, than what it is now. Thank you all so much for coming. Doug, thank you for being here. Ray, thank you, TJ. It's because I'm old. I can't. <laughs> and Kathleen, thank you so much for coming. And just take a moment, look around the room. These are our allies. All of the people in this room have a passion and a caring for the forest and have come to share this moment with us. And just look behind you, acknowledge one another. It comes from community, it comes from how we care for our world and each other. So thank you all so much for coming. What a beautiful day and have a great evening.